Good morning, everyone. We are so, so, so excited to have you join us for our first ever virtual Kentucky Social Work Lobby Day. I'm totally geeking out, looking at the chat, seeing people from all over the state, from universities, professionals, students. I totally am, am geeking out. That's the only way to put it. Um, we have an amazing day planned for you. Um, but first, I want to remind everybody why we are here. We are agents of change. Like, I love that phrase, agents of change. And we do it together. We have an amazing set of code and ethics that allow us to be the most demonstrative agents of change ever. And in that code of ethics, it talks about our engagement. And so I'm just gonna read that real quick to remind us why Lobby Day is so important regardless of what discipline we are going to go into social work, whether it be macro, micro, meso, direct, indirect, it, it doesn't matter. We are all social workers. We are all agents of change. And this is what our code of ethics tells us. It says that we, social workers, agents of change, we should engage in social and political action that seeks to ensure that all people, all people, have equal access to resources, employment, services, and opportunities that they require to meet their basic human needs and to develop fully, fully. We, social workers, agents of change, should be aware of the impact of the changes in policy and legislation to improve social conditions in order to meet basic human needs and to promote social justice. This is what today is all about. And Carrie is gonna tell us the different sessions that are gonna help us engage in these ethics and these goals. So let's get our day started. We have worked so hard to put together an incredible day for us all to join together this morning. Um, to start our morning off discussing advocacy here within the social work field, we have Miss Jamie and Miss Lloyd. Jamie comes to us this morning with over 15 years of experience in public policy, advocacy, um, political and civic experience. So from leadership positions, such as being on the Kentucky Advocacy Manager for the American Heart Association, to lobbying for many organizations, such as the National Association of School Social Workers, Jamie's a true public leader. She has worked under many leaders, including Governor Steve Bashir, Congressman Hal Rogers, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, and so many others. One incredible success that I'd like to share that Jamie had was after her five-year-old son was diagnosed with stage four Burkitt's lymphoma leukemia. Jamie rallied to pass the first ever pediatric cancer legislation. As of 2021, she'll have led the way in raising more than $10 million in support of childhood cancer research, while also overseeing 16 different projects for Kentucky children fighting cancer. She graduated from the University of Kentucky and has a master's in public administration from Eastern Kentucky University. She's also a student at Cornell studying in the Psychology of Leadership Business Program. Jamie, we are so glad to have you here with us this morning. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me okay? Yes. All right, awesome. Let me pull up my slides here. And first, let me just say that I am not a super formal person that I would love for you all to post um, questions in the chat box as we go. And this, I want this to be a conversation, not me talking at you. Just a second. I want to try to share my screen or uh, let's see if we can get this going here. This is the fun part of Zoom, right? Jimmy, is that for the um, for the video? No. Uh, um, I can make second. you um, co-host and then you should be able to share your screen. Okay. Now here we go. All right, I'm set now. Um, so thank you all for allowing me to be here today. I feel very priv privileged to be in this position and profession. 
I love being a lobbyist, although I prefer to call myself an advocate. Um, I like to say I don't represent clients, I represent causes. Um, as, as she said, my son is a uh, childhood cancer survivor. And so when you're faced with that type of situation, become very aware of time. And so I decided that when I was able to go back to work, I would only lobby or advocate for things that I personally felt very passionate about. Um, and so I try to operate from a place of um, authenticity and compassion and passion for everything that I do. And so I'm very, very um, grateful and proud to represent the Kentucky Association of School Social Workers and Kentucky Association for Psychology in the Schools. Um, so I like to say that I don't represent clients, I represent causes. Um, and I think that's one of the key um, reasons that I've been successful. Um, and first, I want to say thank you for what you all do. Thank you for dedicating your career and service to help so many who are marginalized in our communities um, and families and individuals who are struggling and vulnerable. Um, I actually got associated with um, school social workers and social workers when my son that um, was diagnosed tried to go back to elementary school. Um, he missed his whole first year, or, 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 or his whole year of kindergarten um, and then went to Garden Springs Elementary for his first grade year. And he was so anxious uh, um, and the, he, he couldn't even go to class. Um, so I would first start out sitting outside the door and then inch my way down the hall and he missed more than 60 days of school. And the only reason that he was able to be reintegrated and to have a successful year is because of our school social worker. Um, and so I'm just so thankful for what you all do and your different um, lines of work and appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I wanted to show a photo. Let's see if I can do this. Um, technology is not my friend usually. Um, can you pull up the picture that I sent to you? Carrie? Yeah, I am not okay. sure that I got a picture. I know that I got the link. Um, let me see if I have it. Okay. I'm sorry, I do not have a picture. Oh, that's okay. Um, I wanted to show a picture of my family, but that's okay. Um, so there was a question about how I became a lobbyist. And I wanted to talk about that first because I think maybe people wonder how do you become a professional advocate or what's the pathway? Um, really, I started at a very early age. My mother was vice mayor of Campbellsville. I saw some people from Campbellsville logged in. Um, so shout out to you all at Campbellsville University. My mom was Dean of Education at Campbellsville and I grew up in Campbellsville. So um, a special hello to you all. Um, I became a lobbyist. I first started out going door to door with my mom. Um, and then I watched a, a debate on TV in middle school and just got so fired up and passionate about one of the candidates um, and disagreeing with their position. And so I wrote a letter to them and ended up um, being contacted to speak for this particular candidate in middle school. Um, and then I just kind of got the political bug. I started uh, just volunteering for free, going door to door. Um, my parents are never, you know, super connected or made any contribution. And I think that a lot of people think that that's what it takes to become a lobbyist, but really it was just the willingness to um, work for free for candidates that I felt passionately about based on their position. And so um, I met Leader McConnell in 1997 when I was 16 and, and had an opportunity to go to Japan through a scholarship program. And since 1997, Leader McConnell and I have been super close. Uh, and of course, as Senate Majority Leader, uh, now Senate Minority Leader for the United States Senate, that's been very helpful. Um, then I worked for Governor Ernie Fletcher and the first Republican governor in 32 years. And after we lost, I decided to 
I had traveled the state with him um, as an advance representative meeting with local officials, um, helping to write speeches and basically traveling the Commonwealth. And so after that, I wanted to use that experience to then advocate for things that I felt passionately about. And that's when I started with the American Heart Association. So really, I feel like advocacy is just being passionate and persistent um, and operating with a purpose. Um, there's no magical formula. It's all about relationship building and anyone can do it truly. And so I feel like um, I'm very blessed to be able to do what I do. I work very closely with Babbage co-founder as a partner with their firm and, and uh, operate independently um, as well. So I hope that that helps to answer that question. And I, I would love to talk to anyone more about it that would like to talk about how to become a lobbyist because it truly is an extremely rewarding career. Uh, um, and now even in the digital age, we've all had to um, pivot just like you all have to figure out how we contact legislators, how we can be effective in a digital virtual world. So today I hope that you feel more um, equipped at the end of this and, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So when my son was diagnosed, uh, um, I, I was off work for quite some time and I specifically remember the day that um, I, I just didn't know what to do and I wanted to go back to work but I wasn't sure and I came across something on Pinterest actually and it was an acronym for fear you might have heard this before. So it stands for forget everything and run or face everything and rise. And so I decided that I would use our pain for a purpose and face everything and rise. And I think that that really showed me the power of a personal story. And that's what I think you all can do to be successful as advocates. So what to expect today? What is the advocacy? Um, we're gonna talk more about that in detail. And then I really thought that having a history of advocacy is important um, to talk about where we're going in the future. You first have to understand where we've been. And so I wanna um, throw it to Lori Vogel, that's president of the Kentucky Association of School Social Workers to give a brief history of advocacy. Hi everyone, thank you for coming today to Social Work Advocacy Day. Um, Lobby Day started about five years ago with NASW and about 40 people in the rotunda. Um, over the past five years, it has grown into a really big deal, as you can see. We have 225 people on here right now, which is significantly larger than the 40 that we first started with. Um, today we have uh, almost, or we have, um, Instead of one organization representing here in ASW, we have six and we have 21 schools of social work that are here today. So this situation, um, this, this uh, event has significantly grown over the past five years. Um, as a social worker, Lobby Day inspired me to find my advocacy. As the president of the Kentucky Association for School Social Work, I realized that um, we really had no presence in Frankfurt and we had a lot of work to do. And so um, in conjunction with Jamie, kind of helping us understand, you know, why advocating is important and what the pieces of it are, we were able to uh, make some, make up for some of that lost ground. Um, Senate Bill 1 had just been passed and I don't know if many of you know about that, but it was the School Safety and Resiliency Act and it completely left social workers out of school-based mental health, which was very concerning for us. Um, social workers and schools were gonna be fighting for their jobs because we were not included in any kind of funding. Um, so that day in the rotunda, that fight kind of started. And over the next year, we mobilized, we held advocacy 101 trainings for our members. We met with key lawmakers over the summer and we testified in front of um, the House and Senate education committees to help them understand what social workers do. So we really had to advocate for our, our profession because we knew that that was what was best for kids. In the end, um, Senate Bill 8 was passed, which fixed some of these problems and we were included as school-based mental health service providers. 
which was really exciting to see our advocacy making, helping it see um, action, that we got action from that. And it was, it was exciting because it really worked. It was really fun to um, work bipartisan. We worked across the aisle. We met people, concerned lawmakers from both parties. And it was um, really refreshing to see that advocacy does work. So um, thanks again for letting me speak for just a moment. And Jamie, I'll send it back to you. Yes, thank you so much, Lori. It's been so much fun um, working with you. I also wanted to reference last year, we passed Senate Bill 42. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with that. It was great to be able to collaborate with the school counselors, um, school psychology, um, or Kentucky Association of Psychology in the schools, um, and then the school social workers testifying all at the same time um, for a suicide prevention bill that um, Lori really had a vision about to put uh, suicide prevention hotline numbers on all the school backpack tags. Um, as well as some other very critical uh, information that students could access in times of crisis. So advocacy does work and um, I was so thankful to be a part of that. So I'm obsessed with Simon Sinek um, and his TED Talk. I don't know if you all are familiar with it, but um, he talks about the golden circle. And in short, what he says is that when we operate from our why, instead of what, we are infinitely more impactful because authenticity is so valued in our society. So the first lesson I want to tell you is to make it personal. Think about your personal experience. Think about people that you've helped, children that you've helped, and then um, focus your conversation with legislators on those stories. So what is advocacy? Um, the, the definition of advocacy is public support for a recommendation of a particular cause or policy. The concept of speaking out on behalf of other people. It's simply sharing your story in, in an authentic way to people just like you and me, but who can make a legislative vote. Um, and then there's the difference in grass tops advocacy versus grassroots advocacy. Um, grass tops advocacy is, are um, you think about um, campaign contributors or um, presidents of associations or um, people that, have, that hold high political positions um, or positions in the community. And then grassroots advocacy, which is really my passion, is mobilizing coalitions of, um, of folks just like you all and, and through collaboration, building support to pass legislation. Um, grassroots advocacy is just speak, supporting and speaking up for your profession um, before governmental bodies and other organizations that can make decisions affecting your profession. Um, and this can be done to various levels depending on the time that you have and the level of involvement you're seeking. And of course, we have three branches of government. So we um, lobby the legislative branch and the executive branch. And by the legislative branch, I mean state representatives and state senators, and of course the executive branch is the governor of Kentucky. And you might be surprised that even one contact, one single constituent contact can make a huge difference. Um, if they have not yet arrived at a decision on an issue, you have a chance to impact their choice. Um, so a recent data that I came across, it said 78% of legislative uh, folks said that they would be influenced by multiple constituents affiliated with a cause. That's a pretty high number. 75% um, would be influenced by a representative from a cause. 69% would be influenced by just one single constituent representing um, something that's important to you all. So never doubt that your voice does matter. Um, I'm such a sucker for cheesy quotes. And so one of my favorite ones is, um, from Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Um, 
So where to start? You, the reason I want Lori to give a brief background is because to um, move forward into the future, you have to understand what's already happened. So we have to understand what our state has already done or already has in the works. And uh, we can help you all do this. And I'm sure that we're gonna talk about this later in the day when we have the panel with Representative Westrom and Representative Wilner. Um, they are longtime friends of mine and so thankful for their collaboration in the past. Um, and then I talked about a little bit about coalition building, finding your partners and other advocates you can be a team with. We can help and train and guide you, but collaboration is key. Um, actually, I think that, um, you know, virtual advocacy, while it's not ideal and I miss seeing everyone in the halls and I miss the days that we would have hundreds in the rotunda, I think it can be actually be helpful for organizations like ours and professions like yours, where you have to be in your communities, you have to be in your offices, you have to be in your schools. And it's very difficult sometimes to take a day to come to Frankfurt, but now we can mobilize at any time of day or night and contact our legislators. Um, and then begin to make connections. It's really important that um, you don't just see your legislators in Frankfurt at the Capitol on a busy day when they have meetings and 15 minute increments for nine or 10 hours a day. It's so important in your communities to reach out, know who your legislators are um, and try to develop relationships. And that's really what lobbying and advocacy is based on. And then prep your story. Think about what you've done in your career, a particular child that you've helped, um, something that you're most proud of. Your story, really, you're gonna hear me say this a lot, is the most important um, a tool that you have to be a powerful advocate. Um, and then thinking about who do you know? Um, you might be, be surprised about uh, who you know that can be impactful to a certain legislator. And then think about who you can know, make it a priority to seek out opportunities to go to town halls, to have coffee with your legislators in the interim. Um, and then just think about how you can build relationships and keep them. So a lot of the important work happens for lobbyists and for advocates like you all in between the legislative session cycles. So we call that the interim. Right now we are in the legislative session we're in a 30 day session. Um, we should not be dealing with the budget this time, but last year because of COVID, um, they only passed a one year budget and now we're back for a 30 day session that ends at the end of March um, to have another budget session. So it's been a very different year for advocacy, um, but it's still so important to be engaged and involved. Um, so, even though I'm emphasizing using your story to create change, I want to just tell you that it's important to be concise. As I said before, most times um, legislators will have meetings in 15 minute increments all day and every 15 minutes, um, 15 to 30 minutes, a group will come in with a different cause or a different story or um, a different ask. So we have to develop and practice to have a concise and impactful story. Um, and then make sure you share your connection as to why you chose this line of work. Use facts and figures to back up what you're saying. I know in my childhood cancer advocacy, um, it's very easy for me to be tell an emotional and authentic story. But then at the same time, it's important to have data so that we're not just asking based on emotion. Um, and then think about what motivates you. Why do you want to advocate for your profession? Um, be persuasive and make sure that you're ready to tell them why you're asking them to do what, you, what you're asking. And so before we talk about advocacy in the digital age, I wanted to show this video. It is really one of my favorite videos. Um, and it, it, you'll see why um, this is so important in terms of tips that we'll discuss for advocacy in the digital age, in the virtual age. So if you could play that video now, that would be great. Do we have volume?
Can we try again? Shifting sounds in the region. Are you guys able oh, there we go. Sorry. Is that better? Okay, there we go. Okay, sorry. Let me go ahead and get it going. That's okay. Scandals happen all the time. The question is how do democracies respond to those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for uh, <laughs> the region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift, shifting, shifting sands in the region, do you think relations with the North may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. Uh, <laughs> pardon me. My apologies. Region. My apologies. North, uh, sorry. Um, North Korea and South Korea's policy choices on North Korea have been severely limited. Mm -hmm. So this is what we don't want to happen, right? We want to be ready um, and make sure that you're in a spot where you're not gonna be interrupted, uh, um, where you're not gonna have pets in the background. Um, and, and literally when I watched that, I, I laughed out loud uh, because I could see that happening to me. Um, so that's what we don't want. Um, and meeting tips in a virtual world, there are some similarities, of course, as if you, we were in person with a legislator, you want to introduce yourself um, and then identify what group you're from and your credentials. And it's very important to thank the legislator for their time. Um, as I said, they're very busy and we always want to come across as grateful. Um, and then explain why you're here. Share your story and why this is important to you, and then include any relevant facts and figures regarding the issue in the state or region. And then at the end, restate your ask. Advocacy in the virtual age specifically, something that I know I always have to do is when I log into Zoom to change my name. Um, for some reason, my son's name always comes up on the Zoom um, when I log in. So it's really important that you go in and change your name so that they know who they're, who they're talking to. Um, it's important to position your camera pop properly. Um, I, in the Zoom world, it's important also to be brief, just as if you were meeting in person. Um, we all have li li limited attention spans, so to keep engagement, Meetings should be short, uh, um, between 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the number of attendees. And then try to make a connection, um, a little bit of small talk, you know, especially if you're a constituent, which means you live in their district, um, try to get, make a connection so that they understand that you are from their community. And then Zoom etiquette, dress the part. Uh, um, logo free attire, dress as if you're in the office with them. Um, that shows that you're serious. You don't want to have on your pajamas or you know your yoga or at leisure wear. You want to be dressed as if you were going to the Capitol. And then mute yourself when not speaking, of course. Um, you also want to set the scene, clear the background visually as much as you can, um, free of noise and distractions. Make sure your TV is off, silence your phone, and test your camera angle and technology before starting. And make sure you have the working setup that you need. Test your microphone and connection. Make sure that your camera is on. Um, as I said, update your name and affiliation in Zoom when you enter the meeting. And then close the deal. Clearly restate each ask um, and ask your legislator to support uh, more mental health professionals in schools or more mental health um, funding. Whatever your ask is, make sure that you conclude with restating why you're there and then say thank you. Now, I would like to answer any questions that we have. I can't see in the chat box. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, um, you guys are able to um, put them in the chat. So if you have any questions about lobbying or anything for Jamie, you can just go ahead and um, you can ask those now. Jamie, I also have that um, photo now, if you'd like me to share it. Sure, that'd be great. Okay.
I just like to make it more personal. These are my three children, um, Paxson, my survivor that's 12, um, Ansley that's 10, and Maura that's five. So um, I think that just uh, making it more tangible for how to become a lobbyist. There's nothing special about me or, and I didn't come from a powerful family. Really my only talent, I like the, the quote is that I just won't quit and persistence and passion um, is what it takes to be successful. Let's see, I love questions that are coming in here. We, okay, we hear about lobbyists that tend to be more unethical than others. How do you compete with those lobbyists? Um, that can be true. I compete by working harder. Honestly, um, I think that a lot of lobbyists don't have passion. They take on clients that they don't um, particularly agree with even. And so I, I, I strongly believe that persistence and hard work um, and thinking strategically, um, working in the interim, um, aligning constituents from key areas to legislators that are in leadership positions. Um, I've traveled across the state when I was the smoke-free Kentucky grassroots coordinator. We really needed Rocky Atkins. He was um, majority floor leader in the House of Representatives at the time. We needed his support. And so I drove to Sandy Hook, Kentucky, um, and went door to door downtown um, during their tobacco festival when I was trying to pass a smoke free law and um, got signatures of support and built up a grassroots network of support. And I think that's what it takes to compete with lobbyists that sometimes make questionable um, decisions and positions. Uh, and it sounds cheesy, but it really does work. Persistence um, is our number one, I think, uh, resource and authenticity. Let's see. Okay, what's the next question down? So the next one is, how do you stay nonpartisan while advocating? So I, I've always been a nonpartisan lobbyist. Um, I have more experience in the Republican Party, but I... I make it um, very intentional about working across party lines. Um, and I never post about um, one candidate or another on social media. So I try to be very purposeful about working across party lines. Um, I don't make contributions to any candidate so that there's no question that um, I am a bipartisan lobbyist and whenever I'm building up sponsorship for a piece of le legislation, I try to make it equal with a, an equal number of Republican sponsors and um, equal number of Democratic co-sponsors. So I think it's just um, thinking ahead, um, outreach, and um, being intentional about it. Let's see. Um, How do you, oh, let's sorry, see. go ahead. Oh, that's okay. Um, are there any widespread misconceptions that you might share about um, I think I would just, you know, I get um, frustrated, I guess, the connotation around lobbyist maybe is the same as a lawyer, but um, not all lobbyists are bad. That's why I like to call myself an advocate, but lobbyists really do play an important role in the process of passing legislation. And um, I think that there are misconceptions about what lobbyists are and do, uh, but really advocates like me are just trying to represent causes, not clients, and do things that are gonna create meaningful change for children and families across the state. Um, is there any specific legislation that you would encourage us to look closer at in the current session? Um, of course, our number one priority this year is the budget. And so we've been having meetings with the governor's office and the cabinet and specific legislators um, months in advance about raising awareness for the need to have more funding for mental health providers and schools and more funding for social workers in general. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID and um, this one year budget, 
I think that best case scenario, we remain um, where we have been in the past. So we're not gonna get a decrease in funding, but we're not gonna get an increase in funding. Um, it's gonna be a continuation budget and um, hopefully next year when it's actually a budget session and um, a COVID crisis has calmed down a little bit, we will be able to make a stronger push for um, increase in funding in both of those categories. Um, is the majority of lobbyists work done for free on a voluntary basis? Yes, the, the Capitol is always filled with hundreds of advocates that are there um, for free. And I started working for free. And um, the way that I started as a lobbyist, I said, let me come work for you until you see that uh, you want to pay me because I'm gonna work so hard that we're gonna win. And, and that's how I became a paid lobbyist initially. So um, yes, there, there are hundreds of advocates I, and I encourage everyone to be involved and, and anyone with very intentional relationship building can become a paid lobbyist. I really believe that. Um, let's see, there's one up. What are some typical, um, let's see, hold on a second. What are some typical responses you get from lobbyists after you meet with them? Um, so other lobbyists or legislators? I think you probably mean legislators. Um, in general, uh, legislators are very kind. Um, of course, there are people, there are bad apples in um, every profession, but most of them are very responsive. And I find that they're intentionally vague, which can be very frustrating, but um, you know, they're normal people just like us. So a typical response, especially if you're a constituent, um, tends to be more positive. Um, and they'll ask questions. They want to know your personal stories. So I think that that's the most typical thing that I get from meeting with legislators. I love all these questions. Oh, can you elaborate more on grassroots advocacy groups? So grassroots uh, advocacy is um, where there are more people that are not in high level positions. It's people like you and me in communities, um, just um, working together, building coalitions. So for example, um, in an issue I'm working on, we, have, we work with the Foundation for a Healthy Kentucky, uh, um, American Heart Association, uh, Kentucky Youth Advocates, and then we have over 500 other organizations like the Kentucky Medical Association. Uh, um, uh, so if we wanted to pass legislation, grassroots advocacy is getting as many people, I call them like on, on the ground troops, people that are willing to come in advocate from the, the um, legislators district as constituents to share their story. So it's more about mass numbers rather than um, a donor, a high-level donor making a call. Who exactly pays you when you become a paid lobbyist? Um, so when you become a paid lobbyist, it's um, like for me, I lobby for associations typically, nonprofit organizations. Um, all of my clients are nonprofit organizations that and um, legislators are actually not allowed to pay us and we are not allowed to give legislators anything more than $25. So usually it's an association or in the case of other lobbyists, um, but one of the biggest spenders uh, with lobbyists every year is big tobacco. So Altria uh, um, uh, is a huge uh, client of, of a lobbyist that I know. So they pay that lobbyist to try to oppose any type of tobacco um, legislation. And so that's who that would, uh, who would pay that lobbyist. So um, interest groups like that. And, and, and then there are the nonprofit lobbyists like me that work for associations, which I love. Let's see. 
and try to scroll down here. Sorry, still scrolling. Um, there's one good one about a new social worker becoming a lobbyist and just what those connections might look like. Um, yes. Um, as a new social worker, the first step would be to find out who your legislators are. And, and so let's see, I had, let me pull up the website. Um, if I can, um, to find out who your legislators are and what's going on with the legislative session, you can simply Google Kentucky Legislative Research Commission. And from there, it's very easy to find out who your legislators are, the calendar for when the legislators are, are in session, which means that they're actually in um, the Capitol or the annex. So if you all wanna write that down, Kentucky Legislative Research Commission. And that just has a, a huge um, library of information where you can see who's in leadership in each chamber. So by chamber, I mean in the Senate and the House of Representatives, um, really follow through the legislative process, but just finding out who your legislators are is the number one um, thing to do as you start to become an advocate. And then also you can call the um, annex or the Capitol anytime and leave a message for your legislator, even if you don't know who it is. Um, it's 1-502-564-8100. If you want to, want to write that down, 502-564-8100. And you will be connected with their office, so um, you don't have to feel intimidated by thinking that you're going to be directly connected to the legislator. Um, that does happen sometimes in the interim, but generally you'll be connected with their aid and you just leave a message. Um, there's a pink slip that they then collect and um, it's pretty old school actually. And then they make a pile of those for um, people and constituents that support the issue and then those that oppose. And that's how they determine how they vote a lot of times. So I encourage you all to um, call that number today, even after you finish your sessions and share with them, um, raise awareness so that we can improve outcomes in this legislative cycle and in future legislative cycles. Um, let's see, how do you determine what to include in your story to keep from becoming too emotional or losing the legislator's attention? I think emotion is a, a great, um, I, I guess I would say, tool. I never hesitate to be emotional. I think that being, I've said this word, I think at least 10 times, being authentic is so important and showing emotion is a natural part of advocating for something that you feel strongly about. So I feel like being emotional is not detrimental. I feel like it's actually helpful um, for them to see how passionate that you are about a particular issue. So that's a bad question for me because whenever I, I advocate, I'm very emotional and I feel like if I'm not emotional about the issue, then I shouldn't be advocating for it because it's something that means something so much to me. And then we have time for just one more question. Um, so the one I see is, um, would a social worker need to work within groups that fit in their ethical values and beliefs? Let's see. A social worker would need to work within groups. That, yes, yes, I think that's a, an important distinction to make. Of course, we want to work with other organizations that um, share similar beliefs and values and, and then build upon those shared commonalities to um, progress and to um, make, make sure that you're successful. And you always want to work with people that share the same values as you and that helps with the grassroots advocacy and building up the groundswell of support to pass legislation. So yes, absolutely. Um, and understanding, I think, you know, just the, the rules of lobbying and basically that you can give them gifts and you can give them awards though. So that's a tool that we have. 
Um, but legislators want to hear from constituents like you all and want to understand and hear stories about what you do. And the more often you can share your story, not only during the legislative session, but during the interim, the more successful that we're going to be collectively. So um, thank you all for allowing me to speak today. I really appreciate it. I really do value so much um, about what you do. And I appreciate your interest in advocacy and hope to see you all in person next year in the rotunda when we can all be back together and um, advocate uh, for the cause that we feel so passionately about. So thank you all.